talk. We're going to have a Paul Bielovic's talk on the uniforms of the Rochester Red Wings. Uh, Paul has done an extensive amount of research um, into Red Wings history. He's uh, spoken before at this uh, about uh, the Rochester baseball stadiums. So uh, looking forward to him talking about the uniforms today. Thank you. So as Ryan said, I've done research on a number of different topics related to Rochester baseball. And uh, I've talked, I think, a year ago or year and a half ago at, at one of these talks about baseball stadiums that Rochester has had. And for some reason, I, I kind of like researching what might be considered as more obscure topics, things that people aren't always thinking about every single day. We think about the players, we think about the games, but I like to think about uh, some of the things that, that are maybe not as common. And so one of the little niche areas that I've done a decent amount of research on is the uniforms that the Red Wings have worn throughout the years. And because it was an area of curiosity for me, uh, when my pro research project started many years ago on this topic, I reached out to the team and found that there wasn't a lot of information available. And in fact, the team doesn't do a lot of, fo doesn't focus a lot on their own history, which is part of why we formed Rochester Baseball Historical Society in the first place. So I had an interest in researching the Red Wings uniforms and creating uh, some sort of a database of uniforms that the team wore. And so when I reached out to the team, uh, they said, yes, this is something that, that we would be interested to learn about, but we don't have much to help you with. We have a few pieces in our collection, not jerseys, but we have hats. We have photos that we can help you, that we could you know, show you and, and could help you along your way. So when I started to put this information together, it was actually for the purposes of writing an article for the Red Wings yearbook. And they actually liked it so much that it became the cover story that year. So the Red Wings 2010 yearbook, this was eight years ago now, uh, features the research that, that I was able to do and features some great photos by Joe Torito, who many of you know. He's the Rochester Baseball Historical Society president and the Red Wings photographer. So throughout the course of my research, I was able to get in touch with many local collectors who own the actual pieces, who own the hats and jerseys, and then we were able to kind of hook Joe and the collectors up with each other so that Joe could photograph their jerseys, hats, and, and other uh, uniform type items uh, for the purposes of making this database, this catalog. Now what was interesting to me is unbeknownst to myself, there was already another Rochester baseball historian that had done and was doing similar research on the same exact topic. And his name is Craig Brown. Where he came into the picture is for a time, he actually was Joe Torito's next door neighbor. And so they kind of, Joe put me in touch with Craig and I started communicating with Craig, who now lives in Atlanta. And we touched base and found out that he had some pieces of the puzzle that I didn't have and I had some pieces he didn't have. And so together we combined our research and created, as I said, kind of this database that I had envisioned. So what I have here to show you is a chronological breakdown of everything that the Red Wings have worn throughout their history. And I'd like to, even though he's not here, I'd like to thank Craig not only for his help doing the research, but all of the graphical renderings that you're going to see throughout here were created by Craig. So he put together a great overview, kind of a, a PDF document, which you can actually find on the Rochester Baseball Historical Society website. So if you go to rochesterbaseballhistory.org, and click on the research projects section, uh, you'll see Craig's research as well as my own. So although this focuses on the Red Wings, 1928 to present, I want to show just a couple examples of some things that Rochester baseball teams wore before they were known as the Red Wings. Uh, so you've seen, uh, those of you who have attended these talks before, you've seen Tony Brancato speak, and uh, he plays uh, 19th century baseball for a team called the Rochester Live Oak, which is a recreation of a team, an actual team from Rochester in the 1860s. And this is what they wore, this one farthest to the left. Pretty indicative of the styles that baseball teams wore in the mid 1800s. Uh, as we progress through the late 1800s and early 1900s, the uniform styles tend to look a little bit more uh, along the lines of what we're used to. Uh, they have the, the, the collars, the larger collars, which are not obviously what the players wear today, uh, but the knicker style pants, um, 
it, it, as you can see in the late 1800s, some of the teams had lace-up jerseys. So each of these teams uh, that I've represented here are significant for different reasons. I've included the 1890 Rochester's. Does anyone know why that is a significant year in Rochester's baseball history? Why was 1890 a significant year for Rochester? That's right. It was our one year in the major leagues. Uh, good. Thank you. Um, 1894. The reason I included that is because that's the, uh, the team photo, 1894, that we uh, borrowed for our logo. So you can see that's the uniform over there that we borrowed for our Rochester Baseball Historical Society logo. So I thought that was visually interesting enough to use it for that. So I included it here too. Um, we have 1902. This is uh, one thing that's interesting is even for the teams where we have photographic information, it's always a guess as far as the colors. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit as I go and as I present some of the information. Um, information about the colors of Rochester's uniforms wasn't really available until color photography became more prevalent. Uh, so a lot of the times it's based on best guesses. And even when you study period photographs of the time, navy blue and red, as you'll see, are the key colors throughout many of the years that the Red Wings have been a team. Uh, are, don't, are, don't always appear in a common way in black and white photographs. Sometimes red appears lighter than blue, and sometimes due to certain filters, like polarizing filters, maybe blue can appear lighter than red in a black and white photograph. So it can kind of, it can be a little bit tricky. But so part of why I included this one here from 1902 is because that was one that we did have a, in a newspaper account, we did have a description of the actual colors used. So I thought that was interesting to include. And then the last one here, the Rochester Tribe, this was from one of the last years before they were known as the Red Wings. So the Rochester Red Wings became the Red Wings in 1928. They moved into what we know as Silver Stadium, what had been built and known as Red Wings Stadium at the time in 1929. So they actually played one year as the Red Wings at the old Bay Street Park uh, when they began their affiliation with the St. Louis Cardinals. And that was the first year that they wore the set. Here. So this is what they wore their very first year as the Red Wings. Uh, so this page represents the 1928 to 1931 years. Uh, so it was uncommon at the time. This was actually fairly unique for baseball teams to wear a graphical representation of their logo versus uh, their team nickname, or much more often you would wear either a single letter representing the team moniker or say the word Rochester on your chest. So this was actually a pretty uh, a pretty unusual uniform at the time. Um, one of the things that you'll see, not very common today, but much, much more common in the early days is the prevalence of the team stockings or socks. So in many years, the stocking color was what differentiated a team. And that's where team names came from in certain cases, the Red Sox, the White Sox, the Red Stockings. Uh, Rochester had a team called the Brownies and it actually wasn't named after the Kodak camera, as many thought, but it was named after the color stockings that they wore. Uh, so this, this early set here, um, one of the things, and again, these are sort of based on best guesses, but one of the things that I found interesting is that even in those years, the teams had home and away, uh, not only uniforms, but hats to match the uniforms. And so it's pretty clear, it's, it's unclear exactly what color that road hat might have been, whether it was kind of a cream color or a tan color on the front, or it might have been a heather gray color to match the jerseys. But it definitely wasn't red, because you can, in the home and away photos that I, that I researched and studied, they looked a lot different from one another. So one was dark, one was light. Uh, they, they wore this lighter color on the road. Uh, colored belt loops were prevalent in those days. Uh, so that was another kind of interesting aspect. Again, it was all black and white photos that I had to use uh, for my research, but you can see, I don't have a laser pointer, but you can see the, the belt loops here are colored. So if you kind of line up the colors with the wings, you can guess that those were red. And same thing, the, the colored stockings there as well. So see, the, the stockings look like a solid color block in this photo, but if you look at higher resolution photos, which I was able to collect, you can see that they're actually tricolored bands like that. Moving along, in 1932, the Red Wings adopted some very interesting uniforms, and in fact, some of my favorites. They had these triangular pennant-shaped inserts in their sleeves, 
And again, it was a matter of some conjecture as to whether these were red or navy blue, which was the accenting color at the time. But I thought, these really must be red, because the red wings, I think it was meant to be a visual representation of the team name. Now, they only wore that style for two years, from 1932 to 1933. And in those years, they mixed them with uh, different socks and different hats. But that, that unique style, uh, home uniform, was, was interesting. And I'm actually a collector. Not that I can really afford to be, but um, I collect old jerseys and as much as I can. And this one here is a recreation that I had made because that's one of my, as I mentioned, one of my favorite styles. So my mother, who is a very good seamstress, actually made that jersey for me. And so I, I custom ordered that chenille patch for the chest, and then my mother got uh, wool fabric, and I actually found a, a women's red wool skirt on the rack at Goodwill that we used for the sleeve <laughs> inserts. It was perfect. So sometime, actually when I spoke with my mother, she said, are you going to wear your jersey for the presentation? And I said, oh, maybe I could, but I didn't. So uh, anyway, but so that's one of the, the kind of a prized piece in my collection. It's not, I mean, it's not historically, it's not 80 years old, but it's, it's as historically accurate as we were able to make it. Uh, progressing through the mid-30s, uh, the, the road uniform tended to stay pretty consistent year to year. It was just a gray uh, version of what they wore at home. Uh, but in 1935, they actually wore a completely blank uniform which in those days would have been fairly unusual. Uh, many of you that are Yankees fans, uh, you'll, you'll know that in, in many of the years, what we know as the Yankees pinstripes with the NY on the chest logo, that NY actually wasn't introduced until 1936 as the chest logo on the Yankees uniforms. So for all of the years that Babe Ruth played as a Yankee, he wore blank uniforms, just pinstripes. So if you see photos of him wearing a jersey with an NY logo, that's actually uh, after the fact, after he had already played, like when they brought him back for old timers days and things like that. So there's your little fun fact. So the Yankees wore blank uniforms in some of those days, so did the Red Wings. So here's an example of what that looked like here and here. That's their 1935 set. In 1936, they began what became uh, a more uh, a style that they wore for a number of years. So what I suspect that they did is they actually took the uniforms from 1935 and sewed the words Red Wings on, on top, over the top of the blank uniforms. They probably wouldn't have ordered a new set in 35 and a new set in 36. Um, so and another thing that's kind of interesting is in all the photos you can see there's a button that goes right in the middle of the W. If they had ordered new uniforms, the buttons would have been laid out a little bit differently so that the W wasn't obstructed by the button. So we actually showed that button. And it's kind of hard to see here, but in the representation there. And then in 1937, they got a new set for home and on the road, uh, which is what you see here. So this is one of the first years where they actually started to feature navy a little bit more. So previously, they, they kind of highlighted red. Uh, from 1937 through 45, which is when these sets were worn, um, they, they featured navy. Now, I wouldn't have guessed that necessarily based on black and white photos. Just by looking at these, you can see these letters are dark, but they could have been red. You don't really know. The way I was able actually to figure that out is I found one color photo of this set. It was in an eBay listing of a bunch of memorabilia. And I didn't end up buying the eBay item, but I saved the photo, which shows one color photo from some year. I don't know exactly what year, but some year that they wore this set. Now, throughout this period of time, obviously, World War II was going on, as well as the 1939 centennial of baseball, which those of us who are baseball histori historians know that that's essentially apocryphal. That was celebrating 100 years since Abner Doubleday invented baseball in 1839 in Cooperstown. We know that's not true. I mean, we know that baseball was played here in Rochester at Mumford's Meadow in 1825. So, and that's another topic that we've spoken about in our various talks. But nonetheless, uh, all of the teams in Major and Minor League Baseball wore that patch in 1939. Uh, there were two different patches worn throughout the World War II years. The first one here, which the Red Wings wore in 1942, uh, it was called the Hail America patch. And what the Hail America program was, it was actually an, an FDR program to get 
people to be more healthy, to uh, emphasize athletic programs for students and things like that. So that's what that health patch meant. And then the World War II patch, just the, the stars and bars, which again were worn by uh, major league and minor league baseball teams. Now, what we found, when I say we, I mostly mean Craig and myself, who had done this research independently of one another, and only found out about each other later, uh, is that they wore these patches somewhat interchangeably throughout some of those years. So if you look at a photo from 1943, some players might have the health patch, and some players might have the stars and bars patch. And that's not because they were inconsistent in their application of the patch. It's just that teams didn't supply the players with as many jerseys in those days as teams do now. You might be issued one new jersey a year. So a player who's playing for the team in 1943, who also played in 1942, might be wearing their 1942 jersey if their 1943 one was dirty, for example. So that's why you'll see some photos from 1943 with the players wearing the health patch. But for reasons like what I just said, that also, it complicates matters when you do the historical research, because then you're like, well, was this hat really worn this year, or was the hat worn only in that year? And a lot of times what I'll find, or what we did find, was that in spring training, for example, anything goes. Uh, they might wear jerseys from 1936 in 1940 spring training. It doesn't mean they wore the jerseys in the game, it just means they wore what they had on hand. So we did have to sort of be careful as we were doing a lot of that research. I'm going to start going a little bit faster because I have more to cover and uh, I, I do want to be respectful of the time. Uh, in the 19, uh, after World War II, uh, in the 1940s, they adopted a style that many of us recognize. This is what a lot of the historical photos show uh, from 1946, really through 1969, I'll show on the next slide, they wore styles which looked similar to this with minor variations from year to year. So that was uh, one period of really long stability in terms of what the team wore. Uh, in early years and in some of the later years, like the 70s and 80s, the team changed what they wore almost every single year. But this is one period with a lot of stability. So when this style was first introduced in 1946, uh, the Red Wing script was pretty, it, it, it stayed the way that it was for a long time with a few minor variations. Uh, the only real difference between this earliest set and some of the later ones is that the early set had double striping on the sleeves and uh, um, yeah, and around the, the sleeve ends, down the shoulders and around the sleeve ends. So as you can see in this photo here, you can see examples of that double striping. So it was thin red stripe, thick white stripe, thin red stripe. And then uh, in 19, I think, 48, they went to the style with the thicker red striping. So this was actually almost identical to what their parent team, the Cardinals, were wearing at the time, right even down to the stripes on the socks. So in these years, they, as I said, they, they kept consistency throughout the years with a few minor variations. Um, the hats, this again was a, an early example of a visual representation of a team logo on the hat. So you'll sometimes still see that available as a throwback hat. And then er, in the early 50s, they had a navy brim, and then in 1954, they went with a red brim. So this is where some of the actual photos start to come in. So this is a 1950 jersey that's in the collection of one of our local collectors. Uh, so he was gracious enough to let Joe photograph that jersey. Some, several of the jerseys you'll see throughout this presentation belong to him. That's the oldest jersey that I'm aware of that any Rochester-based collector has, is 1950. So if anyone knows any collectors who have actual Red Wings jerseys older than 1950, we would love to photograph them just to add them to our historical record. So let me know. <laughs> So in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, really, as you can see, the basic style is similar. In 1956, they added numbers to the front of the jerseys, and that's a style they kept for many years. Uh, here's some, some more color photos that show what they look like with the different sock and sleeve variations. In 1961, when they became an Orioles farm club, they went from red uh, highlights to, or from red accessories to navy accessories. Uh, they still really kind of visually looked like the Cardinals, but that was kind of a, a bit of a, a milestone when they changed affiliations. They also changed certain elements of their uniforms. Now, the research that I've done also covers accessories like jackets and batting helmets and things like that. For the purposes of brevity for this presentation, I didn't want to include a lot of that. 
kind of extraneous information, but this is one I chose to include because it's so unique. Their batting helmets in the early 60s had a ball with wings logo, which was actually hand painted onto the batting helmets. And you can, I didn't include any photos of it, but in some of the period photos, you can see those wings go almost like a football helmet most of the way around the helmet, kind of to the sides. It's pretty interesting because, again, in those days, not only were batting helmets not entirely common in the first place, but to have someone who, either the equipment manager or someone who worked for the team, hand painted all those logos, it's pretty interesting, I think. Um, and, and again, the, uh, the, the script style R ended with the Cardinals affiliation and then they adopted a block R on the hat in 1961. It went to a slightly bigger R in 1963. One other quick thing I'll mention, again, I want to make it quick in the interest of time, but uh, I'm assuming those of us who are familiar with baseball and the story of baseball in Rochester know about the 1957 stock drive. So upon successful completion of that, the following year the Red Wings adopted this sleeve patch in 1958. So all the uniforms from 58 through the mid to late 60s had that 82-22 patch on the left sleeve commemorating the number of stockholders in Rochester community baseball. And that was worn on home and away uniforms for many years. Uh, in the 60s, the mid to late 60s, they changed styles to a, a simpler style. It didn't have all that uh, thick piping going down the chest. But one of the things that's interesting, and again, I have a lot of li funny little anecdotes that I came up with, that I was able to find through my research. What they would do is they would wear a particular uniform for two years and then buy sets every other year. So in one year they would buy the home set and in one year they would buy the road set. So in 1965, the team decided we're going to go to a slightly simpler uniform style. But that wasn't the year to buy the home set. That it had just bought a new home set in 64. That was the year that they were going to buy the road set. So in 1965, their road uniform looked like this. It was the simple gray Red Wings uniform with piping around the neck at the sleeve ends, but not that thick braiding down the chest. So someone got the idea, instead of uh, wearing what we had worn at home, why don't we try to modify our home jerseys to look more like our road jerseys? So someone actually took a seam ripper and took all of the home jerseys and actually pulled up that braiding on the chest and reconfigured it into a strange looking ring around the neck. So for just one year, 1965, they had this weird ring around the neck right here. Now that jersey right there belongs to Gary Sawicki, who's one of our Rochester Baseball Historical Society members. And you can tell that that's exactly what they did because the, the thick braiding still goes behind the letter W. So in these days, the Red Wings chest logo, it wasn't a felt or uh, tackle twill applique like jerseys are now, that was actually embroidered right into the wool fabric. So because that was embroidered over the braiding, that section of braiding behind the W remained after they removed the braiding. So for just one year, 1965, they wore these kind of weird looking Franken jerseys, if you will. And then in 1966, they, they got the home set to match the road set they bought the prior year. In 1970, just for two years, 70 and 71, they adopted this very conservative, maybe plain style. Uh, we've seen this set in more recent years, sometimes when the team uh, does turn back the clock days, they wear throwback uniforms. This uh, became etched in Red Wings lore because the 1971 team was one of the best teams in Red Wings history, and this is what they wore. So they had a plain block R on the chest for the home jerseys, the word Rochester for the road jerseys. Why we've shown two different versions of it is these are actually different colors. So in 1970, they wore a standard kind of a heather gray on the road. In 71, when they got a new set, it took on a, a more bluish grayish hue. And so again, the, the same collector who owns the 1950 jersey has both a 1970 and 71 road jersey. And he, he sent me a photo of the two items held next to each other, and you can very clearly see the grayish hue to the 1971, the bluish hue to the 71 one, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, this, this is an example of the hat they wore in those years. So that wasn't embroidered into the hat, that was an actual an applique that they sewed to the hat. So again, this, this hat is something that the team has worn again more in recent years as they've tried to do their kind of throw back the clock, or turn back the clock throwback style games. So there's a lot of stars that wore this uniform. Bobby Gritch was among them. 
uh, many of the other big names that played on the 70 and 71 teams. Now, all of the uniforms I have showed you so far were uh, wool flannel, very thick, very heavy. In 1972 is when they went to what's known as polyester double knit. So much lighter weight, much different style of construction for the jerseys. So instead of wearing belts, they wore this style called Sansa belt, which was elastic waistbands. Uh, it was instead of a cream color uniform, it was a bright white, kind of a real crisp white that looked really bright under the stadium lights. So most major league teams adopted those in 72, so did the Red Wings. So this basic style is what they wore throughout most of the early to mid-70s. Again, I'm, I'm going to go start to go a little bit quicker in the interest of time. Um, in, the, in 1976, coinciding with the bicentennial, they adopted a really kind of garish red, white, and blue set. Now, in these few years, they didn't actually even have a gray road uniform. They wore all different variations of red, white, and blue at home and on the road. So from 70, for 76 and 77, they had two jerseys, one that was solid red and one that was red with white sleeves, and two pants, one that was white and one that was red. So they actually did all kinds of mix and match combinations. This photo of Altabelli here is an example that shows the red pants. And for two games last year, the team trotted out throwbacks with red jerseys and red pants, which I, I would be curious to know what the players thought of that. But. In uh, 78, they went with a slightly more conservative home and road uniform. They still had a, a red jersey for the road, but it had gray sleeves and gray pants. Um, and then in 1980, they went with a, a more, slightly more conservative gray on the road. So uh, the 81 road, that's the one that Cal Ripken would have worn when he was on the team. So there's a photo of him wearing that 1981 road jersey. These were some of the years when they started to switch hats much more often. So again, in the interest of time, I won't point out all of the year-by-year -year variations, but one thing that was kind of interesting, in 1970, they wore a hat with the number 50 on it for the first half of the season. Does anybody know why they might have worn a hat with the number 50 on it in 1979? Does anyone have a guess? What, what was the significance of the number 50? It was the 50th year as the Red Wings, or? It was the 50th year of uh, Red Wings Stadium, Stadium. Stadium, Red Wings Stadium, which opened in 1929. So that was to commemorate the stadium. Whereas a team, majors or minors now, might wear a sleeve patch or something like that. They trotted out these hats with the number 50. Well, a lot of the players and the, the fans didn't like the 50 hat. So after a few months, they actually got slightly more conservative, normal hats that they wore for the rest of the season. So if you look at photos of the team from 1979, about half the photos you'll see have this number 50 hat and half have the R. In 1982, they went in a very different direction. Uh, you can see they kind of look like the Phillies. So pinstripes, it's the only time the team has ever worn pinstripes, and a powder blue road uniform, which was all the rage at the time. In the late 70s, early 80s, many teams, majors and minors, wore the powder blues. And uh, in 1983 was the 100th anniversary of International League Baseball, so they wore these pillbox-style hats as well as the commemorative patch on their sleeve. So that pinstripe one on the left, that's one of mine. That's actually the only kind of older jersey that I have. Most of the rest of the ones I own are 80s, 90s. Um, that that um, road uniform there belongs to Gary Sawicki, the same one who had the 1965 one. And then in 84, they actually had separate home and road hats, which matched the uniforms, the pinstripes for the home. There's a photo of it. And then this kind of powder blue for the road. So again, I'm going to kind of quickly go through some of the next. Uh, although they'd been with the Orioles for 20 plus years at that time, uh, by the mid 80s they finally switched to start looking a little bit more like their parent team. So 81 was the last year that the team used navy as their accenting color. In 82, 83, 84 it was just red and white, and in 85 is when they took on black. So now a lot of teams wear black as kind of a style trend. The Mets for many years wore black in the late 90s, early 2000s. You could argue maybe that the Red Wings were a little bit ahead of the curve. So they actually, this is when batting practice jerseys became a little bit more prevalent as well. So the team had a solid black pullover batting practice jersey, which they occasionally wore for games, which was again unusual in those days to have an alternate game jersey or a practice jersey that you'd wear in games. But I do have newspaper photos showing them wearing this in actual games. Um, so the home uniform was this. 
in 85 and 86, they wore red and white on the road, and then it wasn't until 87 that they went back to a gray on the road. Uh, in the 90s, again, a little bit more conservative style. They stuck with a black variation of the home jersey, which they wore this black with the script R at home and on the road. Uh, this script looks similar to what they had worn in the previous few years, only the piping around the sleeve ends went from a very thick braid to a much thinner. And again, this was very much coinciding with what the Orioles were wearing at the time. In the mid-80s, the Orioles had this very thick trim like that. And then by the 90s, it was back to belts and more conservative styles. No more pullovers. It was all button downs. So they wore this style for a few years. Uh, when it was known that Frontier Field was going to open, you know, most of us know the story. It was originally slated to open in 96. They delayed it for one year. So in 95 and 96, the team wore throwback styles all throughout the season to kind of commemorate the history of the team as the stadium was closing. So here's one example of the sleeve patches they wore. The 95 sleeve patch, I don't have a picture here because I ran out of space, but it's the same exact patch just without the sequel 96 on the bottom. Uh, but I'll point out one other thing. So for just these two years, they brought back this ball with wings kind of retro style, only they put the letter R in front of it as well. So that was only meant to be worn in 95, but when the stadium wasn't ready to open and they played the sequel year in 96 at Silver Stadium, they wore that style again. This starts to look a little bit more like many of us recognize the team now. Again, we think of them changing uniforms a lot, but for a long period of time, uh, from 97 until, even until the, the 2000 teens, they wore some variation of this uniform. So this, this particular home jersey with the sleeve trim the way it was, was worn for four years. And then on the next slide, I'll show you, they went to a white vari variation. Sorry. That was my alarm telling me I'm over on time. <laughs> um, and then this is the white variation of that same black jersey, which they wore for a few years, a red alternate. Lots of sleeve patches and things commemorating different things. Uh, and then this is the style they wore right up until their, their most current style, which I have on the next page. So again, just a few changes to the road uniforms, for example. This shows what I talked about before, that they wore this as a throwback style for a few years. And then this is what they're wearing now. So they kind of, uh, after wearing black at home as their primary home jersey for many, many years, they kind of went to, again, a little bit more conservative style, which looks like this. They wear this one in games occasionally. They stuck with the block Rochester for the road uniforms. And then I have one last page here, which shows, again, what many of us know. So while the, the home uniforms are a fairly common, fairly conservative style, many of us have seen them wear all kinds of crazy variations for special events. A lot of times these are for charity, they're raising money for charity, or they're commemorating things like 4th of July. Probably the most successful promotion ever is this one right here in the middle, which they did last year at the plates. So I've just compiled images from throughout the last 10 or so years. This is actually just a very small sampling of what they've worn through that period of time. All kinds of throwbacks, all kinds of crazy colors and patterns, as you can see here. So I just thought it'd be fun to pull together some images showing the various uh, crazy things that the team has worn. So that's it for my slides. I apologize that I went a little bit over, but uh, does anyone have any, any quick questions before I wrap up and we move to the last presentation? Does the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame have any that they're willing to share and let Joe photograph? Or? So the only Red Wings item, uniform item, that the Baseball Hall of Fame has is a hat from the 33 inning game in 1981. They don't have any other jerseys, any other hats. I actually called and asked. So they have, I think it was the catcher's hat that he wore for 32 or 33. Actually, I think they've got Steve Grilly, so they have a picture. Maybe, maybe that's it, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the only item I'm aware of that the Hall of Fame has. But so they don't have anything going back to... Not that I'm aware of, no. Or no. And in fact, you know, as I said, I'm still not 100% certain on some of the colors. So if I ever did find a 40s or 30s or 20 Red, 20s Red Wings jersey, I would love to just see it, just to see if my, my guesses were accurate as for the colors. Does, uh, are, are these individual photos available on either the Rochester um, baseball history website or is it just Joe? 
Through Joe. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we have them posted on our site, but I, I'm sure Joe would be happy to share with anyone who's interested. Joe Torito. Any other questions before we wrap up? For those, uh, on the Rochester Library website, and I'm sure you're familiar, I think it's the Albert Smith collection or whatever. Albert Stone, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Albert yeah. Stone. There are some just beautiful photographs yeah. in yeah. black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and a lot of those are from the pre Red Wings days. I was those say, are, pre -day, pre -day, a lot of those are from Bay Street Park, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of material available in those oh, days. Yeah. Just for, for most of the early, well, almost all of this research I did just by pouring through DNC archives, because that's what's readily available. You know, but the microfilm is, is very of varying quality. You know, they didn't start becoming available in, in grayscale, which is better quality until 80s and 90s, even. So. All right, well, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to talk afterwards. Thank you. He's